Alrighty, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the ACM general meeting today. Um, make sure you go ahead and sign in before we get started to um, add to your loyalty points. Um, the sign in link is in the QR code here and also in the YouTube description below. All right, so if you have any questions today uh, during the meeting, go ahead and navigate to our Slido. Um, it's uh, L S L I dot uh, D O and then the room code is Wang. and go ahead and type your questions um, you have there and we'll be answering them at the end. So if you haven't paid your membership dues, um, you can do it online uh, at our website. Um, you can scan that QR code or um, if you have cash, um, we can figure out a way to um, get your member dues, but uh, your best bet is paying online. Um, so if you haven't joined our Slack already, we highly recommend this. Um, this is where we've been doing all of our communication for our announce, our announcements or events um, and different kinds of opportunities. Um, so a way to join our workspace, um, you can either your pay dues on online or you can email our council email and ask to join there. Um, some channels uh, in our Slack include hackathons, careers, and opportunities. Um, these are kind of self-explanatory, but we are always posting to these um, for opportunities that you guys can take advantage of. Um, you follow our social media. This is also where we keep up to date with all of our meetings, um, so you won't miss out on anything. All right, so our loyalty program, if you are um, a member this semester, and you get one point if you attend an ACM or ACMW general meeting um, workshops or socials, and then two points for major events like Rowdy Hacks. Um, so if you make 20 points this semester, which is coming up, um, you won't have to pay dues next semester. Um, and then if you're a senior and you won't be coming back, you'll have the opportunity to get a stole. Um, if you're wondering how many points you have, you can go ahead and just scan that QR code. Um, we haven't entered um, a few meetings in, so it may not um, be completely accurate right now, but it'll give you a general idea of where you're at in the semester. All right, so um, because of Corona and since we're not able to give you guys um, some of your goods this semester, um, if you have paid dues but have not received your member t-shirt, um, or if you think you're gonna reach 20 points by the end of the semester um, and you want your uh, stole, go ahead and fill out the, uh, the Google forms in the YouTube description um, so we can get those delivered or mailed to you. Okay, so this is really exciting, but ACM elections are coming up. Um, this is a really, really big deal because um, we wanna make sure that the next ACM council um, is just as great as we were. <laughs> um, so, if you're interested in becoming part of the council, um, go ahead and scan the QR code on the left. Um, the links are also in the description below. Um, if you need a list of all of the available positions we're doing um, and kind of the duties revolving that, um, they're gonna be on the right in that QR code. Um, even if you're unsure about running because you feel like you don't have any prior experience, um, or you just don't really feel ready, just go ahead and sign up anyways, um, because you know no leadership is really required for any of the positions, um, although it's highly recommended. But we just uh, we still encourage you to sign up um, and become a part of the team next year. All right, so some upcoming events. Um, something really new that we just made is an ACM Discord. Um, this is like our social. Discord, um, since we're kind of all stuck at home at the moment, um, but we're doing things like hosting movie nights, um, game nights. Um, we have some really cool stuff going on in this Discord, so really encourage you guys to join. All right, so we have um, the weekly Rowdy Creators meetings on Fridays at 10 um, in the Rowdy Creators Discord. This is also in the YouTube uh, description below if you want to join that. Um, we also have the weekly ICPC meetings uh, this Saturday at 10 a.m., um, which will be in the ICPC Discord, uh, also listed below. 
So um, tomorrow at five, we have a technical interview workshop. Um, if you are about to start that process or currently in the process of trying to get an internship or a job, um, a lot of companies require that you do technical interviews. Um, so it's really, really good to get practice um, whenever you can. So I highly recommend going to this. Um, it'll be on an ACM Zoom call um, that we will announce tomorrow. All right, and then next Monday at one, we'll have um, an ACM underclassmen meeting going over React web development. Um, if you're interested in that, be sure to check it out. All right, and then our next general meeting will be learning about Rust, um, which also be on our stream. Okay, um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Wang to talk about um, the large scale system today. All right, so let me share my screen. Oh, uh, this was still current, yes. No, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, okay. I'm trying to figure out where is actually my presentation. Oh, here it is. Okay, so we're actually in the large scale system research lab and uh, my student, Tian Yi, is actually going to give you a more detailed uh, description of a specific project that we are working on. But here, I'm just to uh, give you, I just want to do a, a brief introduction about the other researchers that we do at this lab. Um, all of our research now is actually doing uh, is all about cloud, about um, resource management and cloud computing. So. In the first in one big group of research that we do is try to enable performance guarantee in the cloud. And it's not really just simple, just any performance guarantee, but we're actually going to see that whether we can enable millisecond grade performance guarantee in the cloud. Cloud is today, is why, why do we want to actually basically uh, enable millisecond grade performance guarantee? The fundamental real drive for this, this, this research problem is that we actually need to uh, the cloud is actually is basically used as a main backend for IoT systems today. So if you look at actually how the IoT system is deployed, we're actually having sensors. Yeah, we have the sensors on the front end that are actually collecting all kind of data. You either from your 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 home, from the uh, manufacturer, from factories, from farms, from um, this on the street. It collects a lot of data, and this data typically, when we actually want to, we need to do something with the data, right? You have to do a inference. You have to do, you have to use the data in the medical setup. You're gonna actually use the data to guess if your uh, person that you are carrying is actually going to have emergencies, or if you actually in the manufacturer phase that you want to use the data to detect whether there's actually a defect, the product is being produced. The most of the data that's in when the actual after they're collected, they're first to send out to an edge device. That is some kind of small device located more close to the sensors. Usually in, in, in home setup, this could be actually something like Alexa or a, a small computer or a router that's running in your home. In the factory, this is usually a small private cloud that actually running in the factory. But these things actually, these edge devices usually has low computational power. And what they can do is they do initial data analysis. They can do initial data analysis, standardize the data, or just actually strip some of the unnecessary data. And they, some of them can also do some really simple machine learning inference at first. But after all this data, but, but if after this actual edge device process this data, some of the models or some of the inference are really complex. Their models are extremely large that cannot be conducted or the analysis cannot be conducted on the edge server. All this data has to be sent back to the cloud. It could be edge cloud actually, but it could be in the main cloud. So all the data is sent to the cloud and the cloud starts processing them. Process actually was basically would do two ways. One is actually in the, in the VMs, virtual machines, it's called infrastructure as a service infrastructure as a service. What it does is basically just uh, this is actually heavier resources that can be used to do very complex data analysis in a short amount of time or actually retrain the model, refine the machine learning model. Or actually there's another way of doing this is we call the service functions. 
uh, it's called service computing or cloud functions. What essentially this thing does is actually just take in the resource, take in data, research, data request, does a very fast process, and return this back to the client, uh, back to Azure, back to whoever is actually required. And of course, cloud actually also do data storage, but that's not really the focus for us at, in, and in, in our research. But generally speaking, when you look at this figure, when you look at this figure, one of the main things that we're actually doing here is really just data processing, data processing in both uh, VMs and cloud functions. And both of them, especially when we're supporting the IoT systems, is actually has a very high, uh, very, very high requirement for latencies. Effectively, actually the one really low latency at millisecond grade and many many of these requests actually has a deadline that you must finish the request in time for example in the health setup for emergency detection you do want to be able to know as early as possible it's probably not really uh <clears throat> it's it's i mean it's you want to know the emergency as early as possible so can so you can actually just notify the first responders and there are a lot of situations. The drug has to be taken. If there is an emergency, the drug has to be taken in a fixed time window within like one hour or within 30 minutes that it can be actually reversed. The total is a negative effect of the disease. So there are a lot of cases that we need to actually, there's so many use cases in LT that require in low latency request the processing. But the problem is actually cloud is not really designed for low latency. It is not designed to handle low latency requests. The whole reason that we have cloud is because it's cheap. It's cheap. It does not provide any performance guarantee. So if we want to provide performance guarantee, we have to redesign the whole way from the system side and from the application side, running on the cloud to make it more, uh, to make it really feasible to tolerate low latency, to make it feasible to guarantee that actual request can be finished in several milliseconds or several hundreds of uh, tens of milliseconds. Okay. There are several problems that in the cloud that I prefer really just to make it impossible to handle the low latency. So uh, we're dealing with basically just two issues. These are actually the two fundamental issues that are in the cloud. The first one is actually called startup plan. What this means that every time that when you actually start up a service in the cloud, the first the first invocation of that service is going to take a longer time because it actually has to start a container or has to start a VM that actually need, need to initialize the, uh, the 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 service but initialize the VM and the initialization is going to take a long time, and this force the call and this first call make this, this initialization is going to make it very is practically impossible to actually just to, service your request with low latency, especially the, uh, basically the first ones. Afterwards, that is actually pretty good that actually all of the requests that can be serviced just by, um, you know, without the initialization overhead. But first one is hard to, is, is actually hard to guarantee that it is, is serviced in low, uh, in a really low latency. And the downside of this thing is that actually this happens a lot. And the first call actually sometimes the initialization is so slow that it actually going to jam the queue and propagate, and the latency is actually going to propagate to all the following calls. So even the following calls do not have the startup overhead, they are affected because queuing effect. The second issue that we're dealing with here, oops, okay. Uh, didn't expect that I could write things on there. Okay. The second issue that we're dealing with here is basically the, uh, the high performance fluctuations. So the thing is basically when running applications in the cloud, the performance is unstable, is extremely unstable. Here we actually have three applications. One is a web serving, is web service. The other one is a machine learning inference. And this last one is data service. It is a data serving application. And this is the distribution of the performance. The bottom the X axis here is the performance. And this, this line here is the distribution. And as you can, you, you can actually see here, that the, the performance fluctuates a lot. I will just use this one because there's no weird red lines on it. So the performance fluctuation, the throughput is actually from 16K all the way to 25K. This is actually how much it fluctuates. And the thing is basically, if you run an application on the cloud and that fluctuates like this, how do you know? How do you know that, know for sure that actually your, your, your service, your application are really running in 
in, in you can, how can you guarantee that your application can always serve your request in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time? So our research is basically trying to deal with these two issues, the fluctuate, the cold startup time and the performance fluctuations. So we have uh, three projects in this end. Is one we're doing is actually new software engineering paradigm for IoT and cloud, which we're actually doing a performance testing and performance debugging. Just try to ensure that you can write a program for cloud correctly without actually just uh, can you can write correct you can do performance testing, you can do debugging correctly so that you can write a program that you know for sure that it can actually run in within the <clears throat> Within that, your performance requirement, the millisecond performance requirement. And the second pro, uh, product that we do is this: this, this pro, uh, the first the two products were really handling the fluctuation issue. Fluctuation issue, fluctuation issue. And the second one, this one, this product we're dealing with the cold startup. And what we're doing here is we do predictions. We predict how many workloads is actually going to come in, in the future. Then we start up the services in advance. We start up the services in advance. But the prediction is actually pretty, uh, this workload prediction is pretty hard. So we're doing some really uh, uh, weird things. It's called automatic machine learning to deal with this. So let's talk about the, uh, the first product, performance testing. What we're talking about actually is the, how do you write correct code? How do you make sure that your code running efficiently and uh, running with a good performance guarantee? Uh, how, how can you guarantee your application running uh, fast in the cloud? The first thing that you want to do, the most reliable thing that you want to do is actually performance testing. It's performance testing. But the main issue is that how do you know, how, how do you do performance testing, right? How do you test the, how fast your program runs? And this is actually just, uh, this figure shows just two tests that we did in cloud, uh, that, that we did on Amazon cloud with the same application, same VM, almost same testing, the same configuration, except that they run at two different times. So the blue line here is one test, the performance result of one test, and the red line here, this dotted red line here is the performance result of another test. And you can see that actually how, fast, uh, how far apart these two things, um, how, how, how far they are apart from each other. The average for the first test is here is somewhere around actually 18, uh, 185 k, and the second, the average for the second is roughly around here is about 22, 225 k, and this is actually there's more than 10 percent differences, and we don't now know which test is reliable. So the fundamental question here is how do you know how do you do performance testing? How do you know that actually you you your application? How do you know for sure that your what is the performance of your application? So we did, we solved this problem basically with, there's also a weird right line. So we actually, we developed a, a very reliable uh, testing approach for cloud. And we're probably, we can very proud to say that we're probably the only group in the world know how to do this reliably. Um, these are just figures to show that how reliable our, our approach is. The blue line here, is the performance distribution that we get. And the uh, right down the line here is the ground truth, which we call, which we actually collected using running the uh, uh, benchmarks on uh, Amazon for six, uh, for six weeks, yes. And this performance distribution that we got here is actually running usually within, within uh, two weeks. And you can see that actually how, uh, how, how matching, how, how these two distributions match, uh, how these two distributions matches to each other. So we're actually, so our approach can basically just uh, tell you that how do you do the testing? When do you stop that you can actually know that your performance is, you actually get reliable performance data. Um, the thing that we do here is th this work is very statistical. We use a lot of statistics tools to analyze the data, to do data analysis and to get confidence, to extract the confidence within the result. And the second project that we do is actually is um, is do performance debugging. So when you do the first project, you know that your 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 application is now is not running fast enough. But why why do you running fast enough? Which part of your code is actually causing the issue? So there's a lot of actually stuff within code level debugging that you have to do to figure out why that happens. There's 
a lot of reasons that actually can cause your code to run slow. It could be a CPU, it could be GPU, memory, disk, the network, there's all of the issues. This is what we're, this is the project that we're, we're working on now. But what we can do is basically, besides actually really just tell you how fast your whole program run, we're able to actually test the individual statement. We can tell you that for each statement that you deploy to the cloud, that you actually throw your code to the cloud, we can tell you which statement actually, how long it takes for each statement. And we can actually, based on that information, you can actually really just uh, know that which line is causing the issue that you actually, you can improve the whole program to make it actually getting close to your performance goal. So this is our second project on performance debugging for cloud system and for service, uh, for, for cloud function. Uh, the third project that we do here <coughs> is a workload prediction. We predict the workload of the, you know, the, uh, the, the job, the, the application is going to encounter. Um, here is this, this figure is actually the, the blue line here is the actual workload that we're actually seeing with Wikipedia. The blue line here is a little bit hard to see, but you can see that it actually fluctuates. This is well behaved workload. This one is actually works pretty nicely. Let me show you another workload that actually is more Easy. This one. This is the paper that we're actually about to publish, and you can see here is the workload of from Google. It's a Google cluster workload. It predicts how many jobs are actually arriving every 30 minutes, every 30 minutes, and this is actually low workload fluctuation. It's completely random. And this one, this is Wikipedia, the one that you guys just see, just see. And this is a Facebook cluster, and you can see the workload is even crazier. We also have another two clusters that I think I can show you. This is Azure, Microsoft and Cloud. This is part of their um, their internal workload trace, and this one is a great workload trace. is is some kind is a different type of high performance computing. As you can see, the main problem here is every workload works, they have a different type of trace. And so how can we build a machine learning model or any model, prediction model, that can actually handle any type of these workloads without actually just, uh, can handle all of them automatically with pretty good predictions? That's the main problem that we're dealing with here. So the thing that we did here is something is called, um, I mean, the, the I forgot to say this. The fundamental issue is actually for generic prediction, we need to determine what are the models that you want to use and what are hyperparameters that you want to use. These are the two things. When you, learn, when you actually study machine learning clouds, you probably already know this. Um, the two things, the, there are several things that you have to do manually as a human. You need to choose the model, you need to manually choose hyperparameters, and you need to manually choose the features. For features, we're actually simple because we're dealing with, with workload, but how do, we, how do we choose models? How do we choose hyperparameters? How do we do this without human intervention? So we basically what we did is something called automatic machine learning, which automatically select this automatic machine learning, which does automatically select the model. And actually is, as we're doing machine learning on machine learning, is actually building a model that actually gonna predict what the model is better. And we do a hyperparameter optimization, completely automatic hyperparameter optimization. We combine all these things so we can actually just uh, automatically build a machine learning model on the fly to predict the, the future workload. And this figure, the right line here is the prediction result. And you can see they're actually fairly close. This one is actually the easiest one to show. Oh yeah, we have other workloads that also has even better accuracy. But they're just uh, too hard to read because they're too much, the workload is too big. So these are the basic research that we do for um, uh, to to enable the performance guarantee for cloud to make cloud ready for the next generation application. The one that Tianyi is going to talk about is about cloud graphics rendering that we're actually running a special different type of application on the cloud, which is just the VR applications or cloud games. And uh, we're redesigning for this type of, for this research. We're actually mostly focusing on the on, on the system design side, how do we design data center systems to really run cloud graphics, this, the three applications more efficiently? We have, this actually are the reasons why we want to do this, and these are actually why, what things that we need to do. Essentially, it's just uh, basically we need to redesign the system. But Tianyi is going to give you a more 
uh, in-depth discussion of all these things. So I will just uh, transfer to him to do the to to give you a more in-depth talk about this particular topic. Um, if you have questions, I may have to leave in the middle. So if you have questions, I think you can. I can take one or two questions for now. Uh, if there's no more questions, I think we can just uh, no questions. We can actually just go directly transport to King. How about that, Leo? And now. Hello? Yeah, that works. Yeah, are there any questions? Um, we have one. Um, so they're asking, when do you see the three projects being implemented onto the cloud servers? Onto the cloud servers? It's actually it's a very good question. The first one, actually, the first two projects are about how do you actually really is software practice on the cloud. So uh, software practice on the cloud. So you don't really need to implement them in the servers, but you have to publish the, to publish the tools to, actually to help people to write the correct program for the cloud. For the last one, we're really looking forward to actually really just uh, release this. It's not really, um, we're probably not really going to get into Amazon as far as fast as we want, but we can actually release these things to a private cloud. To private cloud or actually smaller public clouds that I can collect data and gradually just uh, refining the model and make things going forward. Okay. Great, uh, we don't have any other questions uh, at the moment. Okay, great. Then let's let, let, uh, I'll, I'll let Tianyi do, do, do his presentation. All right, thanks folks. Okay, uh, now I will share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Go ahead. I'll mute myself. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tianyi Liu, and today I will present a picture, which is a benchmarking framework for Cloud 3D applications. This is the outline of today's talk. I will start with describing the background of a Cloud 3D system. For a cloud 3D system, it needs a client proxy and a server proxy to send user inputs to the cloud and send images back to the user. The 3D application runs in the cloud and receives inputs from the server proxy. The 3D application calls 2D, of 2D 3D functions and get frames rendered on GPU. When the frame is ready, it was copied from the GPU memory to CPU memory. And then was sent to, uh, to user for display. Our motivation is that with the popularity of cloud gaming, cloud VR, cloud-based uh, scientific visualization, animation, and simulation, cloud 3D applications are becoming a major type of workload for uh, cloud and data centers. Unfortunately, there is limited public research on how to design cloud systems efficiently to support cloud 3D applications. The main reason is lack of standard benchmarking infrastructure for this new area, like uh, benchmark suite and the performance evaluation tools. To develop benchmarking infrastructure, there are three key challenges. First, generating human-like inputs to interact with running 3D applications. And second, as rendering on cloud involves a client, a server, network, Linux graphics stack, graphics rendering pipeline, and a heterogeneous hardware, measuring performance of each component is non-trivial. Third, as 3D applications are typically refreshed every one or two years, 3D benchmarking framework should be able to easily extend it to new 3D applications without changing their source code. Our goal is to develop an effective 
benchmarking framework for Cloud 3D system that can address these three challenges. Now, let me explain how we design picture to overcome challenges mentioned before. And uh, let's begin from the intelligent client. Instead of using a human player, we want an intelligent client to play games automatically. Inspired by self-driving cars, first, we grab a game frame from screen. Second, we analyze this image using convolutional, convolutional, uh, convolution, convolutional neural network or uh, computer vision to uh, a computer vision to detect the key objects in the image. And third, after detection, useful information is imported into a recurrent neural network which will generate an action for current frame. And finally, our intelligent client will simulate this keyboard event or mouse event, which will be sent to the cloud. Now, when we replace human players with our intelligent client, the architecture will be like this. This is the intelligent client. The AI client generates human-like inputs and sends these inputs to the cloud. And the game runs on the cloud, runs in the cloud, and sends a game frames back to the client. Next, we will talk about the performance, a performance measurement mechanism. First, let's have a look at the home process of uh, generating frames. When generating frame I, stage one, send input I from client proxy to server proxy. Stage two, server proxy deals with input I. And stage three, server proxy send input I to the game. Stage four, the game logic processes input I and uh, update game status. Stage five, GUI related drawing commands are sent, are sent to and executed on GPU. Stage six, when the frame is ready, it was copied from GPU memory to CPU memory. Stage seven, pixel data is sent from game processing, game process to server proxy. And stage eight, server proxy receives the pixel, pixel data and does compression. Stage nine, encoded pixel data is sent to the user through the internet. This is the traditional, traditional pipeline. And the modern pipeline tries to paralyze, paralyze, paralyze stage, six, stage six with other stages. When generating frame I, the stage one to stage four are same, are same as before. The difference is stage six of last frame, frame I minus one, is executed before stage five of current frame, stage five, the frame I of current frame. In this way, stage five of current frame can be executed in parallel with stage seven, stage eight, and even stage nine of last frame, frame I minus one, which means we generate frame I and send frame I minus one in the same pipeline. This is the modern uh, pipeline for uh, cloud graphics rendering. After, after, sen after sending frame I and generating frame, uh, after sending frame I minus one and generating frame I, similarly, 
we can we can send from I uh, we can um, we can send frame I and generate frame I plus one. Send frame I plus one and generate frame I plus two. Here, we will define two metrics. RTT is round trip time. It is the time interval from the client, uh, from the time when the input I is captured by client proxy to the time when the, when the corresponding frame is received by the server, uh, by, by the client proxy. Also, we define the throughput of frames as FPS, frame per second. After talking about the uh, graphics pipeline, we will step into our performance measurement mechanism. In order to get a performance of each stage, the each stage, we inserted several hooks along the home process. Hook one, hook two, hook three, to hook nine. When an event is received by the server proxy, an ID will be will be will be created, and the ID will travel through the home process along with the event. In the meantime, timestamps will also be recorded by each hook function, by each hook function, and printed out at the client side. Now we have finished the picture framework, I will move on to evaluation. We implemented our uh, benchmarking framework on Turbo VNC and the Virtual Xiao, which is a cloud 3D uh, system based on remote desktop. In order to conduct a comprehensive evaluation, we also collected a cloud 3D benchmark suite, which includes four uh, for uh, 3D applications and the two uh, VR applications. All these six interactive 3D applications belong to different categories. And these are the system parameters that we use. Uh, on server, we use i7 and uh, with uh, GTX 1080 Ti GPU. And our client, for our client, we use i i5 uh, I have CPU. Now we will talk about the diversity of our benchmark suite. Diversity of benchmark suite. The figure at the uh, upper right corner shows the CPU utilization uh, on X axis and the GPU utilization on Y axis. From uh, for CPU utilization, it ranges from 70% uh, to 260%. Well, the GPU utilization ranges from 20% to 55% to, uh, to Delta 2 has, uh, has the CPU utilization. Well, STK has uh, the has the GPU utilization. We also evaluated the CPU utilization of VNC it ranges from 160% one, uh, um, to 240%. Next, we will talk about uh, memory utilization. The blue bar is CPU memory, and the yellow bar is GPU memory. From this figure, we can, we can get that the uh, STK 0AD and IM, IM and VR, um, use more CPU memory than other applications, than Red Eclipse, Red Eclipse Dollar 2, and ITP. For GPU memory usage, uh, STK, uh, Red Eclipse, and Dota 2 are much higher than 0AD, uh, IM, and ITP. 
the figure at the bottom right shows the PCIe bandwidth uh, at the left side and the network bandwidth at the right side. The green bar is the PCIe bandwidth for GPU sending data, GPU sending data, green bar, it's GPU sending data to CPU. And the yellow bar is PCIe bandwidth for uh, GPU receiving data, GPU receiving data. A GPU receiving data from, uh, from CPU. And the orange bar is network bandwidth. Orange bar is network bandwidth for sending frames from cloud to, 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 to collect. From this figure, we can find that STK is very special because of high GPU receiving uh, bandwidth. Also, zero ED consumes the highest uh, network bandwidth. Since the benchmark suite covers a variety, a variety of 3D applications with diverse, with diverse behavior and uh, uh, resource utilizations, we can conclude that our benchmark suite has a good diversity. And we can, and we can use this benchmark suite to evaluate Cloud 3D system. Uh, next, uh, we will talk about the evaluation of our AI client because we also develop an AI client. The left figure shows the comparison of RTT distribution, round trip, round trip time distribution, got from intelligent clients and human players. Let's take Super Taxacart, the STK, for an example. STK IC uh, denotes intelligent client, while STK H denotes human players. From the, from the result of Super Taxacart, we can find that the distribution of RTT are very similar. For other applications, Zero ED has the maximum, maximum uh, difference, but the difference is still within 14%. Uh, so from this figure, we can conclude that uh, our AI client has high accuracy and it can mimic human players faithfully. The red figure shows the performance of our AI client, the blue bar is CV time, convolutional neural net, CN time, convolutional neural network time, or C, or computation time. Um, and the yellow bar is uh, the input generation time, the recurrent neural network time. The CV time is less than 100 milliseconds. And uh, uh, the input generation time, input generation time is less than three milliseconds. Comparing to human response time, 0.2 seconds, AI client is faster enough to interact with 3D applications. So here we can conclude that our AI client is accurate and fast enough. We can, we can use this AI client to evaluate cloud 3D system. Now uh, we will evaluate the overhead of picture framework. This table com compares the, F the free, uh, FPS frame per second um, without and with picture in second row and third row. Uh, we can find that the FPS with picture is slightly uh, lower than the FPS uh, without picture, except uh, Red Eclipse. For Red Eclipse, picture is slightly higher, uh, is slightly, had slightly higher FPS. Uh, this should be the system fluctuation. From the table, the highest overhead is 5.53%, and uh, the average overhead is only 2.73%. So, the picture has low overhead, 
uh, which means we can use picture to do evaluation. Okay, until now, uh, we have proved that uh, uh, our benchmark our benchmark suite has good diversity. Uh, our AI client is accurate, and uh, the picture framework has low overhead. Next, we will use uh, the benchmark suite, uh, picture framework, and our AI client to do evaluation, to evaluate uh, the Cloud 3D system. This figure shows the frame uh, FPS of six games. The blue bar is a server FPS, and the orange bar is a client FPS. All the server FPSs are higher than 30. So does most of the client FPSs. From this figure, we can learn that the cloud gaming is a new, is really a new promising workload for data centers. Uh, in this slide, we have run one to four instances of same game in our benchmark suite. From the left figure, we can learn that one GPU in, in our machine can serve two, two to three, two to three, uh, two to three games while maintaining at the frame per second above 20, 25, which means cloud gaming can save hardware resources. Uh, because uh, we can use one GPU card in, in our machine to serve two to three uh, players. Also, from the right figure, we can learn that uh, power consumption per game, power consumption per game, also decreased significantly. So from these two figures, we can conclude that cloud gaming has better hardware and energy efficiency. Okay, from these slides, we will uh, demonstrate the effectiveness of our picture by identifying bottlenecks and then propose new optimizations for current Cloud 3D system. This figure shows the breakdown of RTT, breakdown of the round, round, um, round trip time. The send frame time, send frame time, send frame time, uh, and the send input time at a time spent on input sending and frame transmitting on the internet, on the, on the network. From this figure, we can find that the server handling time, server handling time, the blue bar, dominates the round trip time in all cases. Which means for current Cloud 3D system, we should pay more attention to server-side optimization. In order to find the bottleneck of the server, we further break down server time into four parts. The time for sending inputs to game, and uh, the game time, application time, um, and, the, and the time for uh, uh, spend on sending frames from game to server proxy, and the server proxy does compression. From this figure, we can learn uh, that application is most time consuming. So we will further break down the application time. This figure shows the, break, uh, the breakdown of application time. The green bar is application logic time. And the yellow bar is frame copy time. The blue bar is rendering time for a frame. Since application logic runs in parallel with GPU rendering, so application time is actually decided by application time plus the frame, the frame copy time. So from this figure, we can find that frame copy time accounts for uh, more, than half, more than half of the application time in most cases. So 
frame copy should be optimized. Now, uh, we can draw the conclusion that uh, picture is an e effective benchmarking framework for identifying bottlenecks of current Cloud 3D system. Although we have already found the bottlenecks of a Cloud 3D system using picture, uh, we can do even better. Based on our optimization from uh, experimental results, we propose two optimizations. Catching frequently, uh, catching frequently used uh, results and increasing parallelization. Our first observation is that uh, with uh, when copying data from GPU memory to CPU memory, we use the read pixel function. However, when we measure the time spent on read, read pixel, uh, we get two different values from CPU clock and the GPU clock. The CPU time is always larger than the GPU time. And the difference is about six to nine milliseconds. So we are sure that there must be some extra work done on CPU in this function. And finally, uh, we found that XGET window attributes is, call, is, call, is invoked by read, uh, read pixel. And uh, it only returns uh, the window size, but uh, it is extremely slow, about eight uh, milliseconds. Uh, so our key idea is to uh, call XGET window attributes only once and save the results uh, for future use. From this pipeline, we can find that stage six, stage six, call, copy data from GPU memory to CPU memory, is shorter than before. C6 is shorter than before. Uh, so that's the home pipeline. And this is the benefit that we get. Uh, it is caching that makes uh, pixel data copy stage uh, much shorter. Our second optimization is uh, parallelization. Uh, in this figure, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is CPU and DRAM is CPU memory. Uh, this is GPU and uh, it has a, a video memory. In the video memory, it has two uh, memory blocks, FB and PBO. FB is a frame buffer, which saves the data uh, shows on the screen. And uh, the PBO is a temporary, uh, temporary, uh, temporary pixel pic, pixel buffer object. When copy frames from uh, from from GPU memory to CPU memory, it has two sequential steps: frame buffer to PBO, and then PBO to the DRAM. The key idea of our optimization is to trying is, is trying to uh, parallelize these two uh, sequential steps. In order to do this, we create two PBO, PBO one and PBO two. When we copy data from frame buffer to frame buffer to PBO one, we can also copy data from PBO two to the DRAM. Similarly, when we copy data from frame buffer to PBO2, we can copy data from PBO1 to the DRAM simultaneously. So the, graphic, uh, the graphics pipeline becomes uh, faster. Uh, and from our evolution, our optimization could improve server FPS by 28, 28% on average, and 67 and 67 uh, percent at a maximum. The client the client FPS also client FPS also increased by 10% uh, on average, and the round trip time was reduced by 7% on average. 
Now, uh, let me quickly conclude. In this work, we present, we, we propose a picture uh, which has an intelligent client of a performance measurement mechanism. And the intelligent client can faithfully mimic human actions to interact with 3D applications. And the mechanism can identify system bottlenecks efficiently. Also, to prove the effectiveness of a picture, we uh, collected a benchmark suite, conducted a comprehensive analysis, and uh, uh, proposed uh, two optimization. And from our evaluation, we find that benchmark suite has good diversity. So we can use it to evaluate the, 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 the cloud 3D system. And our AI client is accurate. So we can also use it. And the cloud gaming uh, has uh, hardware and energy benefit. And that's the motivation, uh, one of the motivation for our research. And the, and the, uh, the two optimizations uh, bring 28% uh, percent speed up. Uh, thanks for your patience. I'm now happy to answer any question. Thank you. All right, so we have one question uh, and it's, would it be possible to ever have games that require low latency in cloud gaming? Uh, uh, can, can, can I repeat the question? Yeah. Would it be possible to ever have games that require low latency in cloud gaming? That require low latency on cloud gaming. Low latency on cloud gaming. You mean when we will have the games? Oh, I, I think they're asking if it'd be possible if if, oh. if they could do that. Oh, you, your question is: Is it possible to uh, to have games that have to have games that have low latency requirement on cloud gaming? Right. Uh, I think it depends because um, our, our, our evaluation is done on uh, on local local uh, local area network, and uh, we 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 try to simulate the edge cloud, um, and and in uh, in our experiment, the network latency is not a big problem, um, but for uh, for 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 uh, uh, for one, um, uh, the network latency should uh, still be a big problem because uh, because we need, there 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 are a lot of data need to be transmitted from the client the, the server to the client and it depends on the. Uh, on the bandwidth of the network, as well as the uh, comp compression rate of the game itself. If, uh, if some of the game has good uh, compression rate, um, maybe it will have low requirement for, for latency. Uh, okay, um, we have another question. It says, will Pictor be working, uh, be working be side by side by other projects in Dr. Wing's lab in order to improve the cloud environment, especially for 3D cloud systems. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, the picture, uh, yeah, picture is a separate project um, for cloud graphics rendering. And uh, uh, Dr. Wang has another uh, other three uh, uh, projects related to cloud, 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 uh, cloud performance testing, uh, re reliable performance testing, and the perform performance debugging, and the workload prediction. And uh, cloud gaming is, uh, yeah, is a separate one, separate project. All right. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. OK, thank you. All right. Uh, Now let's let me hand over to Leo.
think we finished the stream, Chris.